This is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the PGA Championship by talking to Andy Molitor of Bedsburgs, getting his read on the field, read on this course, and getting you set for golf's second major of the year. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, golf major number two of the year coming up this week. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, pretty excited for the major I've had all the four majors kind of marked off on my calendar, uh, knowing that uh, kind of surprisingly, you know, my golf emails kind of have some of the the highest open rates out of anything uh, that I write. So people who like to bet on football and like seven nuggets also like golf, which is, which is pretty interesting. So I've been digging for all the information I can. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting sitting here still waiting for, uh, you know, uh, matchups to, to go up at some books. Um, you know, I've been trying to dig some stuff in the last week, listen to you and Brandon on, uh, it's the heat check podcast. Yeah. 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 And I was like, yeah, Jim, we need to work on our rapport. You've never sung to me on this podcast, you know, (laughs) and and talking to me about certain sports. So you and Brandon have been doing a little bit longer. Um, but, uh, do you really want me to sing to you? Cause I feel like that's, that's, that's viewed as a negative. I don't know. It sounded pretty good at one and a half speed when I was listening to it this morning. So, oh man, know. I'm I talk way too fast at normal speed. One and a half speed, I don't think I could do with with myself, like listening to myself. No, no, it's fine. it's no, it's, one and a half was fine. I didn't try two just because you don't want stuff to go by too quickly. Yeah, when your dog's pulling you everywhere. <laughs> but, so, if you're listening to a DFS podcast, does that mean we're gonna see? at the power rank in the dfs contest this week no 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 no. i'm looking i'm looking for betting insights right i mean you're still talking about what matters and what golfers are going to do best and like can you translate that into something for betting i'm sure you can i mean i know uh brand doesn't like victor hovland this week so maybe go against him in some matchups whenever whenever you can find those um so yeah it's been an interesting it's an interesting week for me because i'm trying to find these bets and i've made a couple of them but i obviously don't originate any of this stuff right i barely know what the sport of golf is so you know i'm trying to listen for other people you know trying to get you know i've been using stuff and get data golf uh with their scratch plus stuff um so it's kind of like i don't know it's frustrating because i can't do my own stuff but i guess it's kind of liberating because i didn't have to put hundreds of hours of work into building a model either. So it, yeah. it, it's an interesting experience. And, and I think one that is more, indic- you know, is more usual for people who are betting on stuff. Right. Right. Well, I think that for me, it's like, it's a thing that's changed because I also don't have my own numbers for golf. I will, you know, go through a different process, but I think that I felt a lot more free and loose with it a couple of years ago before I was like doing my own modeling for other things, because I see how tough the market is. And so I like the mindset changes of, you know, if you don't model NASCAR and like, let's say you're like, oh, I'm not sure if William Byron can win this race. I'll bet him to podium or I'll bet him to top 10. Now that I like you're in like the these you almost know too much. And like I know that the hold on top 10 markets is absurd right. and it gives you a lot. It gives me at least a lot more paranoia. So I go through, I think, a lot more work now with the stuff I don't model almost than the stuff that I do because I'm worried I'm betting a bad number because I just like a golfer overall. What I will do is I'll get a data golf, uh, lean on their tools, look at their adjusted strokes gain stuff, see if there's a golfer who I think is going to be undervalued by the market. I will check that golfer and then I will... I mean, it's usually I'm checking Brandon's stuff. Um, I'll pull up his simulations over on numberfire.com, see what they say about them and... If he is showing value on them, then I will bet it. But for me, it starts off with finding golfers I think I think will be undervalued by the market and going from there, which is backwards from what it should be. But I think that that's kind of the way I, I have to play things and stuff that I'm not modeling myself. Right. I mean, for me, like I'm not even I don't even have any hunches on golfers. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like like I said, I barely know what the sport is. So for me, it's listening to a bunch of people and saying, oh, yeah. are there two and three? Are there two to three? three different sources that I trust that are all basically saying the same things. Yeah. And so that, that's the kind of stuff. Well, wisdom of crowds. Yeah, exactly. Right. 
Wisdom of wisdom of sharps. Wisdom of sharps for sure. We'll bring in our own sharp here, Andy Molitor. He is on Twitter at Andy MSFW. He is the director of content over at BetSpurts, which is uh, blowing up right now. A lot of good stuff over there across the board over at BetSpurts. He is also the co-host of the Deep Dive podcast uh, with Drew Dinzik. He does brown bag bets as well. We'll talk to him about the PGA Championship, about this course, how he's handicapping it, and much more. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are still doing weekly podcasts throughout the non-NFL season. We're talking PGA. We're talking baseball, getting you set for all those different sports. Hope you help help you fill out good bet slips. Just search for covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review. Also, the NBA playoffs are heating up. You can make every game feel like Game 7 on FanDuel Sportsbook, an official partner of the NBA. Throughout the playoffs, all customers can place a no-sweat same-game parlay each week. You'll get up to $20 in free bets if you don't win. FanDuel has so many ways to play, and best of all, when you do win, you'll get paid faster than a fast break. Either way, you have to $20 in free bets if your same-game parlay during the playoffs does not win. FanDuel Sportsbook, an official partner of the NBA, must be 21-plus in select states. Refund issued as non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max free bet $20 per week. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. It was at FanDuel.com slash RG. In Connecticut, 1-800-NEXT-STEP uh, or text next step to 53342. Actually, that's in Arizona. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777. Visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In Western Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net, or in Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700. Covering the present. Let's bring Andy Molitor into covering the spread to preview the PGA Championship from a betting perspective. Andy, it is a pleasure and a true delight to have you on the show for today. How you doing? Good. Yeah, Dak, second major of the year. Kind of snuck up on a guy. I mentioned that to somebody. I said, I get into my cadence of, and you're familiar with that, both you guys. I mean, just with the various sports you do, you get in that cadence of ad, you know, the, how college basketball lines come out or Jim with your NASCAR. It's like yeah. same thing every week. And I get into this cadence. Then I just kind of forgot, like, man, I can, I can be hammering some lines for this next week on like Friday, Saturday, yeah, Sunday, right. any, you know, two months ago, if I wanted to, you know, I don't like to get too crazy out if I, unless I really see something in someone, but I, I, I already like am behind the eight ball this week. I regret not placing a bunch of bets on some guys. I thought I was going to like this week on like Sunday because some numbers have come down already. And I think maybe a, maybe a little bit of advice for anybody who's going to be betting the, you know, the U S open or the, I'm just called the British Open. It's dumb to call it the Open. It's the British Open. I'm not sure why they decided with the branding, but like know that like if you like a guy and he's playing yeah. good in the tournament the week before, you go bet them right now. That stuff's up already. You're not waiting for Monday. So, well, I think no, part of the sure. reason. Yeah. No, I mean I bet some ROM last week, and you know when I actually don't know if it's moved, but you know, for, for Andy, you must be probably doing a lot of NBA or baseball betting. Like I've actually with my you know things are relatively light for me right now and so you know before the masters i actually just put a sticky note that had the four majors because i knew <laughs> that people in my newsletter would want content that week so you know you just kind of like block out that week so um i don't know you must be doing a lot of other betting because i've been looking forward to this week and it's been it's been an interesting journey yeah no i mean i, I mostly do golf i bet some other people's baseball and I do dabble quite a bit in the NBA playoffs more than NBA. At this point, I've made more NBA bets for the playoffs than I did like during the regular season, for sure. Like I, I, I enjoy that. I know some smart people. I've had some good conversations, and I've, I've won. Like I've, I've made good money. And again, no fault of my own. Just listening to the smarter folks and I—that's the beauty of the networking and having people who specialize. But yeah, a little bit of baseball, a lot of NBA, and now it is going to get a little scant because baseball is a grind. If you really want to get into that, and yep. we're about to lose hockey and basketball here in a couple weeks. Well, I feel but, like part uh, of the reason it snuck up on you is that Betsperts is doing like everything now. Like I think you've within the past couple of months, like 
golf has gone uh, pretty bananas. Uh, Formula One, I think I saw whether I don't know if it was you or four for four specifically, but like there's been a lot of new stuff. So I feel like work, actual work, the non betting side of work has probably been contributing to the surprise factor here, too. Yeah, just the, the part of work that isn't just handicapping and finding and line shopping and betting. It takes up a bit of time, too, doesn't it now? But uh, a little bit. Oh, and, and, you know, Drew and I, uh, Denzik, we did a deep dive last night. And it was just kind of a little bit of menagerie of we talked the PGA, we talked the French Open, we talked the the lotteries tonight, we talked a little bit about the the Preakness, and we started to get into somebody asked a question about football, you know, all the the leaks that led into the actual um, you know the schedule coming out and lines for Week One, lines for some of the bigger games, the international games, regular season win totals and. That's kind of where we're headed here in about a month. Once I run out of basketball, it's just, I mean, we're just going full bore football. I kind of forget about how much time a guy has to put into that. So June, June's football, I guess. Yeah, it's every week is football at this point. You know, I, I for me, I use the time between whenever football ends until baseball to kind of jam in as much so I can just like not worry about it later on. But like... Yeah that's because I don't do NBA. Like I have that open gap in there because of that. But if your people are doing NBA, like that kind of sucks up a lot of time for sure. So we are indebted to you for being here for today to break down some golf and talking about that. And it's a unique event for this week, the PGA championship. Uh, The first time the PGA tour has been to this course, Southern Hills country club in more than a decade. And it's basically a different course based on the renovations they've made too. So I I want to talk about this broadly, you know, from a a template perspective. How do you go about attacking an event when there's little or no course data? Not specific to this week. We'll talk about that in a second. But broadly, when there's no real course data to lean on, how are you attacking things? Yeah, it's tricky because, you know, with any of these majors outside of Augusta, they switch venues every year. So you don't you don't have like a, a normal tournament like the Honda or the Masters. We just say, hey, let's see. How did people play here last year? And what was the weather like? It wasn't a weird year or something. That's a good analog. We can use that data. But this, it was played somewhere else. And for 13 years in between here and there, it was played 15 years now, I think, between here and there. Maybe 07, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. And it was not only is that data probably just bunk anyway because it's a bunch of players who are on the champions tour or god knows where right now it's it was a different course they did a lot of renovating it's an old course it was built in the you know the great depression era it's a very very old course they put up i'm not sure how they came up with the money back then to just be building golf courses but they did and over the course of you know 80 90 years of some of the the landscape changed a little bit of the topography with erosion and the trees growing and a creek dried up apparently. So a lot of the challenges that they set in place when they built this course got easy, like the course got easier essentially. And not only that, they're not using, you know, clubs they made out of wood anymore. So (laughs) the guys are hitting the ball a little further than when this course was designed. So the natural, you know, design challenges, lengthen the course, make it harder by making it longer. And that's nice and all, but there were other things they did here with uh, some of the greens. They shaved off the edges of the greens to make it harder for the balls to hold. They changed up some of the bunkering. They changed up some of the fairway stuff. They did trim some trees that, and the fairways are nice and wide. So if you are accurate and long, you're going to have a really nice time off the tee, but then that second shot is going to be extremely difficult with, it's been dryish. It's been hot, and they're sloping, small, hard, you know, greens with a lot of runoffs, false fronts, and things like that. So it's going to be a lot of balls that maybe hit the green and end up somewhere else. I think we're going to see a lot of around the green work and chipping, sand saves, uh, you know, just overall scrambling here because this course is setting up to be pretty damn difficult. So it sounds like based on that, that your process for like a new or renovated course is just reading a lot, trying to delve yeah. into the changes they made. Is that kind of what you're doing? Is just consuming as much as you can to have a better feel for what the course will play like? Yeah. And then also, you know, talking to people and some of the reading too, seeing like, what are some decent analogs to this? Like, what do you think is a good comp course to this? And everyone has their own opinions on that. And or just seeing like longish course, like long, difficult courses, um, courses that take this particular skill set to be successful or what we believe, you know, it's a lot of guesswork, just like everything we do, what we believe the skill set to be 
where that skill set translates best in looking at who's been successful on those courses, who's been successful in those situations. We're also looking at possible 25 plus mile an hour wins yeah. over the weekend, which turn a tough course into a, does the winner even break par course, which would be, I mean, for the folks that like carnage and want to cheer for the course, <laughs> this might, this might be your Valhalla. This is, this is going to be something if it gets real windy. Yeah. We well, it's supposed that. to be, it's yeah. supposed to get pretty hot too, right? Yeah, like Thursday and Friday, highs in the 90s. So if, if again, if things are just drying out, obviously they have. Some, I'm sure they have some sprinklers, but it's hard to keep. It's hard to keep those greens soft when it's been hot and dry for this long in that climate. So a little cooler on the weekend, but yeah, hot as hell coming into the weekend, and then windy. So it uh, the weather is going to add to another you know layer of difficulty to a course that they they went out and hired a guy to say make this course more difficult so we can have another major here so you do all the reading with regards to the course you try to give an angle for yourself as far as who benefits stuff like that make those tweaks mm -hmm. for for course fits how does it change your betting approach like are you betting different markets do you change your unit sizes do you change how much you go in on the event or do you feel like you've done enough research where you feel confident and kind of attack things similarly to new courses you would for a course that's more established. I absolutely bet differently, different weeks with different courses with different fields based on what uh, the distribution of results is going to look like. There was a week, a couple months ago, I can't remember which one it was. I can go look at my results sometime, but I bet a lot of top 40 prices on like people that weren't supposed to make the cut. Like real, you know, kind of boom or bust lower end guys. Like they're on the edge of the field. They weren't terrible, but you could get some really nice prices on these guys because they, they were a high ceiling, incredibly low floor. You know, and it was that kind of field where nobody knew there wasn't, it was a bad field to say, I'll just say it. Like it was a bad field. There wasn't a lot of top end players there where a lot of these guys could sneak into the top 40 just by kind of redlining for a day or two. And he got big prices on him. You know, and then you end up with places like, you know, maybe the Masters or some of these ones where everybody shows up because it's big money, even just some of the bigger purse ones. And I will bet differently because I don't see people like that. Just, hey, this guy's going to sneak into the top 40. It's like, this is more of a cream rises to the top kind of place. And I think that's where I've landed on with the PGA Championship this week. I think it's going to end up being the best players near the top. I know recent history says otherwise with, you know, and you can't dog on Phil, but, but at that point he was a, he was essentially on the, cha on the champions tour. He's a senior player. He was two fifty to one in some places <laughs> and he got it done. But I mean, it's, it's a guy who'd done it before. So I'm, it's not the same as just somebody coming out of nowhere and winning a major championship. So I do believe it's going to be someone in that, you know, under 30, 40 to one range that does end up on top here. And I have bet accordingly. I'm not taking long shots. Some of these guys that I would bet, like I'm going to take a stab at this guy at 100 to 20 to one, 150 to one. Those guys just, you know what? This guy is going to be a top 30 bet for me. I believe he can play well. His ceiling is high, but the, you know, if you take all these players that are in the top 10, that's a lot of hurdles for a guy like that to jump. Just like he could have the best week of his career, finish tied seventh. And that's just because there's Rory and, you know, Scheffler and Spieth and everyone's just ahead of him. And that's golf. Sometimes you're super right. And the guy still doesn't win the tournament. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense with, with all the, the top players being here. Are you betting mostly outrights or, you know, with majors, you get a lot of other uh, fun markets. Uh, are you, are you looking for those kind of more rare markets with the major or, or just the traditional ones? I did mention one earlier this morning when I was talking to someone. There was, I don't remember if it was a PGA or a US Open, but somebody hung a, a few places. We'll have this this week. I guarantee it was worst, worst score in a round. Like it was, you know, an over 88 and a half or something. Ooh. Will somebody have, and because you end up with some of these, these club pros that get to play, they get to qualify for this. And it's an incredibly difficult course, even for these scratch golfers who are coming in and have to see, you know, Tiger and the group ahead of him and stuff. And someone, someone blows up. So that's a fun, it's fun because it's, it's like your outright gets rolling and you're just cheering for birdies. It's the opposite. This guy ends up, you know, one, it, and it can be anyone. 
you know, so some guy goes six over through four holes and you're, then you add, you have to star him on the app. They're like, all right, now we're tracking you, buddy. We need you, we need you to go in the water. And so that, that's a fun one. I, I usually will play at a really difficult course if they have markets up, but for the most part, I'm, I'm light on outrights lighter than some. I'm usually the guy who plays between four and six. I don't play a ton just because it's it eats up a lot of my bankroll if I'm if I'm betting just a massive amount of those. I do a lot of matchups every week, probably between four and four and eight full tournament matchups. And then every round as the matchups or the three balls come up, I play those. I usually have decent luck with those. And then some like you know, the question you guys just posed as far as changing your strategy. Some weeks top 20, top 30, top 40 bets, even top five and 10 come into play depending on what my strategy looks like. And some weeks I just don't end up playing those as much, but man, you, there are some, you want some props, go shop around right now. There are all kinds of stuff up every week. Now golf, golf props have flourished in the last couple of years. Well, that, uh, that high number one is fun, especially with the wind being what it is this week. You're yes. talking about the greens and how they're being shaved off and stuff like that. The problem is I don't think I could track it. Like you mentioned the starring them on the app thing, because I use that for my DFS player pool. And if I have someone starred yes. and they're 16 over and around, it's going to make my heart stop every time I check the app. So I couldn't do that part, no. but I do like the prop overall. Like my, I just can't handle that part mentally because of the way I use that app. Yeah. I've, I've ended up having to use different apps, different like <laughs> golf scoreboard apps like i'll have one on my phone and one up there it's like yep. if this is dfs these are outrights yep. and then i have a spreadsheet <laughs> like these are my these are my uh guys i'm cheering against because yeah it messes with your head when you look down it really does i i can't deal with that part so let's talk here about the favorites hopefully not in play for the uh over 88 in those situations we got john rom and scotty scheffler both 12 to 1 over at fanduel sportsbook Let's talk about them first. Any lingering value for you at those numbers? Uh, or are you looking for more mid-range options? If we're not looking at long shots, what are you thinking about Scheffler and Rom this week? I ended up skipping over both of them. I believe they can win. We saw Rom play well in a bad field on an easy course in Mexico and get it done. Didn't look like he was even really giving it his all. Still won the tournament. It, he's still very good. There was a lot of talk about him maybe being a little diminished this year it's still just hard to win a golf tournament even if you're the best so i don't think rom's you know gotten worse he's still where he should be but him and scotty probably priced about where they need to be so i skipped over those 12s ended up on some guys in that next tier with uh just based on like we said i looked at the course you'd mentioned i did all the reading did the uh comp courses did the skill compositions like what do these guys do well what do they do poorly how does that affect them and what is their form and then you know in that next year i didn't end up betting rory and jordan spieth so i do have some you know they're shorter odds but not the shortest not the favorites not usually my mo but like i said course like this with this field i do like both of those guys a lot and it'll be it'll feel weird cheering for jordan spieth i haven't done that a lot it's been the other way around for many years and jordan spieth's a fan duel guy so we're uh we're on board of that one for That's sure true. now when did you when did you get him did you get him after the weekend uh when he had that surge or do you get him before i guess i don't know if his odds shortened that much but uh they i mean he played well last week they have come down just uh, there's a trillion reasons to bet him even if they're not the right reasons so it's like oh he's from here or, like, or so it's his career slam i'm gonna bet him so like i it's another one too where i knew everybody was gonna bet him and i'm not sure why i didn't grab it earlier so didn't get the i've got close to 20 to 1 on him so not the worst number but i know some people have got much better numbers uh rory i believe was right around 16 which is where it's at right now at FanDuel. so Sitting on okay numbers. I'm never going to complain. I don't know. It was a, a tweet I made a while back. I said that. It's like, you know, you cash the chalk in golf and people get mad. Like, oh, they were favored. Well, good job. But and if you, if like Rory's 16 to 1, you hit a 16 to 1 in like a first touchdown scorer market, people are <laughs> slapping you on the back and putting you on their shoulders. You're so smart. So I'm I'm more than fine cashing a 16 to 1. That's uh, any money in my pocket's great. No, I like Rory too. What was the selling point for you to pull the trigger on Rory at 16 to one? Looking at his skill set, um, the way he can hit his tee shots were something that's kind of kept me away from him. Uh, last year into the season, he had a bit of a miss off the tee and it came down to his increasing his club speed, trying to get to that spot where he was driving it 
as far as he is, and he does drive it a long ways. That's kind of come into it's it's he's come off the the two way miss he had there. It's been a little more accurate lately. He can hit a nice draw. There's a probably an advantage to players who can do that. Maybe even some lefties if you like just betting a bunch of lefties for first round leader. So hitting the ball a country mile and hitting a nice draw, and then it just his form that last round in Augusta, which. A lot of it was probably pressure off because he didn't actually have a chance to win. But the fact that he could go out there and attack a difficult course and score like he did, and then his form over the last you know month or so as well has me has me liking him quite a bit. Awesome, Andy. Uh, let's get away from outrights a little bit. Are there, any other, are there any other markets in which you see value? So, like I spoke to before, it's a tournament where I really, really struggled to say. I'm going to take this guy at 200 to one because I, re- I think the, and, and I can believe that number is wrong and it should be 125 to one. And I still just don't believe there's enough chances for a guy like that to come out and win this tournament against this field. So like we said, with the finishing positions and that's, uh, that's the great thing. You know, obviously FanDuel podcast, FanDuel probably has the most, markets for this this is hard to find a lot of other places i'm a big top 30 guy top 30 top 40 you guys have so that's always nice and there's a bunch of guys that fall in there where it's like if this were maybe a different tournament i'd be betting mito Pereira, i'd be betting johnny vegas i'd be betting harold varner and definitely definitely matthew fitzpatrick but they're longer shots that I'm just too scared to waste money on them. Wait, watch one of them wins now. That's going to drive me up the wall. <laughs> I'll be sitting there with my uh, two to one top 40 price feeling, <laughs> feeling silly. But again, it's a uh, hindsight's 2020. It's pretty easy to figure out what you should have bet after the tournament, but Mito Pereira plus 115 to top 40 is man. That's probably one of my favorite bets. I'm probably going to write that one up this week. Tommy Fleetwood's another one right in that price range to top 40 i think there's a lot of value on some of these guys that have the skill set but man they just maybe don't have the they don't have it yet to go out here and beat a, a super high-end field on a course that really nobody's played before now uh fanduel doesn't have matchups listed yet and you mentioned you do like matchups quite a bit um have you found any matchups you like in other books uh so far any any guys you're specifically keying in on to bet on or fade in matchups once those are posted yeah it, it stinks because this is another guy and this is part of betting i guess you got to be ready to you know bet on a guy bet on a guy love a guy cash on a guy and then turn your back on him just it's a cold world and uh patrick reed is another one that i've i've been against a little bit lately with uh he did some equipment changes at the beginning of the year his tee shot has been off there's a lot of these where it's going to be a dog leg and then when you land, the fairway is going to be tilted against it. So landing, it's a re- reverse camber, they're calling this, which sounds way fancier than it is, just a, a slanted fairway that if they land wrong, if you don't land that tee shot how it should, you're not shaping your shots properly, there's going to be a lot of tee shots that are in this rough. It's tallish Bermuda. It's, it's hard for people who don't have the club speed to get out of it. So Patrick Reed with his tee shots and like, Two years ago, I would have probably bet him to win this. Like this is a he's a grinder. It's a perfect course for him, but he's a guy I'll probably be against. Again, everything's price dependent. I'll need to make sure it's uh you know within the range I I think it's acceptable. But there's been truthfully a lot of books that have been a little slow with matchups this week. I've uh a lot of the places I end up shopping don't have much up yet. I've I've only seen a few and you know with with names like this, they end up just doing these round robins where it's like Jordan versus Rory and Rory versus uh, Rom and Rom versus Jordan. And you end up with just a bunch of, if you all rank those guys pretty close to the market, you just scroll past like the first 50 matchups and there's not much to bet anyway. So I am going to look a little deeper in the markets and find a few guys that I like. Maybe some of the people I mentioned for top 20, top 30, 40, like, uh, Harold Munoz, or excuse me, Harold Varner is a, a, a slight underdog to Sebastian Munoz, who obviously played well last week, getting a little steam off his name, but that, uh, that's what I have circled for now. So Varner the yeah. third. Love it. HV3, baby. Let's try. HV3. Now, I do want to ask you before we let you go, you can place one outright right now at their current numbers. It could be McElroy or Speed if you want to. Any Anyone on the board, who is your favorite outright right now? 
you guys have pretty much one of the best numbers in the market on Sam Burns. Yes. 48 to one. Love There's it. a lot of places that have 35s on Sam Burns. So right now at FanDuel, 48 to one. He is somebody I have bet this week. I like him a lot. I ended up avoiding him last week when he was getting a lot of love, but this is just another another course where his skill set definitely plays in. I have him pretty pretty high in my model. It's not not somebody who's crazy long off the tee, but long enough and pretty accurate. Avoids a lot of three putts, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in love with that guy. We'll be talking about Sam Burns later in the podcast. Just a little teaser. He will be brought up later on as well. That is Andy Molitor. Check him out on Twitter at AndyMSFW and check out all of his work over at BetSperts and, of course, the Deep Dive Podcast and Brown Bag Bets as well. Andy, good luck to you this week for the PGA Championship. Good luck to you with all the work stuff going on, too. We appreciate the time, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for the time. Always great talking to you guys. Thanks, Andy. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Andy Bolliter for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on the PGA Championship again. Check him out on Twitter, AndyMSFW. Find his work over at BetSpurts, the Deep Dive Podcast, and Brown Bag Bets. If you want more thoughts, uh, more discussion around modeling PGA and just kind of PGA in general, uh, Andy and Drew had on Abnormally Distributed uh, two weeks ago, I think, on the, the Deep Dive Podcast. And that was a really fun interview that I enjoyed listening to. I sent that to Brandon Gadula as well um, for him to listen to because I thought it was just a, a good discussion. And it's it's fun to hear very smart people. I know, Ed, you listen to uh, Abnormally Distributed on uh, Circles Off, too, yeah. Drop Azola. Uh, but just overall, like, good to gather insights from as many smart people as we can. For sure. I mean, he did his PhD in machine learning and was about to take an academic job and then basically bet a bunch of uh teasers on week four nfl preseason and won a bunch and went to his job and found it horrible and decided to bet sports for a living so his circles off interview that they did about a year ago is my favorite sports betting podcast ever uh, i agree so, it's, it's right up there for sure yeah and i haven't had a chance to listen to this one but um but yeah he's certainly interesting he, he actually would post every single matchup for golf tournaments last year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that's kind of one of the things I do this week is just go look at his Twitter account and hope he's posting that spreadsheet with all his results. Uh, he has not this year, unfortunately. But I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff uh, about how to model any anything, really. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of more... You know, I, I don't think he gave too many details about exactly what he's doing, but, you know, I mean, clearly he has the ability to use machine learning techniques. But what I think is also clear from his podcast appearances is that he spends a lot of time beyond just pressing return on a computer. Right. And thinking through everything. And um, yeah, so definitely, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, you can find that one, the one I was talking about, uh, by going to the Deep Dive podcast feed. Um, and then also, like you said, the Circles Off podcast. And the good thing there is it's a smart guest, obviously, but it's also smart people asking good questions. Like Rob asked good questions, but then also Drew and Andy did too. So I think that's the the key there. So if you want more in-depth stuff from there as well, I'd recommend both those podcasts um, to get insights on modeling golf and just general sports betting info let's move now to covering the future for this week ed what is on tap for you uh as you take a look at the landscape for the pga championship yeah absolutely i mean i'm, I'm actually not planning on talking to any golf bets because as i've already mentioned i don't originate anything um i mean i have made some bets i bet tiger to make the cut at like minus 115 um there's some both some numbers and some some other golf pros that i've consulted that think that Think that there's value there there's a couple other bets but i thought i'd take this week to talk about uh betscope baseball so betscope is a tool that colin davy has developed essentially so that you can like bet your hunches right so there's a tool where you can say oh well i think the win probability for this team should be so and so instead of what the markets have you put that into the tool and then it spits out the best bets at whatever sports books that you have and so this is a great tool if you have some beliefs about you know what should happen in game, but in baseball, I, I don't have any. So I've been messing around with a different approach. So I'm essentially looking at a Sharps sports book um, that's not on, on the thing. So I'll take like Circa and look at what their money line implies in terms of probability, what the total implies in terms of how many 
runs there should be in the game, put that into the bet scope tool and let it figure out what markets have been are the best. And what it's been telling me since I've done this is that like there there's some alternative markets. It's not necessarily like the total that's giving you the best value. Um, but it's an uh, alternative total that's potentially giving you the best value. So we're recording this on Tuesday. The Yankees are playing the Orioles, and um, a lot of sharp sports books thought the total was a little bit too high. So you put that into to BetScope, and what it'll tell you is not necessarily to bet the, the, the total for the game, which was, uh, I, I think it was set at eight. I think it was set higher some places, but... Um, uh, the sharp sp- sports book thought that was a little bit high and then bets go put out, Oh, well don't bet under eight bet under seven plus plus one seventy, uh, because there's value on that. And that's all the work that Colin has done to figure out what the best markets are and which sports book might be off, um, at, at, uh, at the, on these alternative markets, there was another one also the Yankees against the white Sox, um, last weekend in which, when I changed the money line probability just a little bit, it actually said, you know, bet Yankees minus two and a half on the run line. So bet bet them at whatever price it was. I think it was a plus one sixty or something. And the Yankees ended up winning by a bunch and, and covering that. So go check out the best scope MLB tool. It's it's up. I've been playing around with it. I intend to do some more. Um, like I said, I don't really have any hunches of my own and it's not even something where I'm trusting my own model. Uh, I'm trusting sharp sports books. And, you know, there's also other things that you can do, like look at uh, uh, projections for certain props, like pitcher props and strikeouts and stuff like that. Go to sites that have, um, you know, ensemble estimates of that and, and put that in the best scope tool and see what comes out. And it's a tool that automatically figures out the best markets for you to bet. And it's actually, uh, if you've read Ed Miller's book, like if you read the logic of sports betting, you mm-hmm. can like take everything you learned from that book and apply it to Betscope. Like, cause the, the learnings you, you, the things you read about in that book are so easily encapsulated by the stuff that Collins built over at Betscope. Um, right. So that's why I find it like super interesting. Cause I just read, finally read the full book uh, this past winter and everything you talk about is like, okay, they've had movement on a spread. They might not have moved the alternate spread in tandem with that. So you can find, Maybe right. not a no hold market, but you can find inefficient markets because they may not have correlated right. the markets the way they should. And that's why having that, you know, going to a sharp sports book, seeing what they say, and then plugging that in, I think that the logic behind that makes a lot of sense. You can also find uh, via that find lagging sports books that may be right. not saying copying the line, but you know, maybe they're uh, following it a bit. Uh, find stuff like that. So I think that the logic there is applicable, not just to betting MLB totals and stuff like that, but it could be something you could use for any sport they offer, honestly. Yeah, for sure. And and you think about how these markets are correlated. You just made me think about how if you're going to move any single NFL season, regular season win total, you should really move all the other 31. As Correct. Because well, they're all correlated. And right. that actually doesn't happen, which mm-hmm. is why often when you look at the entire market, like the sum of total wins is three or four wins greater than the number of possible wins. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that that makes it an easy market to beat by any stretch, but, um, but yeah, that's, it's the same idea. Yeah. And that stuff does still leak through those, you know, just thinking about it in different ways, thinking about, okay, I've got this hunch. What's the best way to attack it. There are tools that can help you do that, whether it be Betscope or other stuff. And, take advantage of a pretty good time in sports betting in terms of the books at your disposal, but also the tools uh, you have as well. For my cover in the future, going to PGA and talking about that guy we teased earlier on, Sam Burns. I want to focus on him because I think he's a bit overlooked by the market this week, not just the 48 to one uh, outright at FanDuel Sportsbook, but also in some other markets too. And part of that could be because Burns has missed the cut each of his past two like traditional stroke play events. But the one before that, uh, he won the Valspar between those two missed cuts, he and Billy Horschel uh, finished second in team play at the Zurich Classic. And I think that the two missed cuts recently may be underplaying where his form is at right now. The key thing with Burns, which Andy mentioned, is how well-rounded he is. He doesn't have big holes in his game, which you can't really have at a course this tough 
Uh, and Burns doesn't. If you look, look at Fantasy National, look at their ranks the past 50 rounds. Burns is 33rd in distance gained, 28th in approach, 43rd around the green for the chipping stuff that Andy mentioned with the way the greens are being built up. If you look at the past 100 rounds on Bentgrass, uh, Burns ranks 32nd there. Altogether, Burns is 23rd in data golf's true strokes gained across the past six months. And that stretch includes a string of missed cuts that he had in January and February. And he seems like he's passed whatever issues he had in that three event stretch. Burns doesn't the best history in majors. He's had no finishes better than 29th, but he's also in better form now than what he's been in previously. And like, you know, you, you kind of are, in, are bad in majors until you aren't. Like, that's the way things work. Hideki Matsuyama couldn't win a major until he won a major. So I don't want to use that as a way to dismiss a guy like this, especially when it is a guy who is relatively young still. The only recent major for Burns was the Masters. He did miss a cut there, but we talked with Brandon a lot about how debutants at, at Augusta tend to struggle. Burns did. So I think that's pretty excusable to struggle there. I talked to Brandon to see what his numbers said about Sam Burns. Um, he's showing value on him in every key market. And you mentioned the 48 to one outright uh, Brandon's numbers do show value there. They show value plus 490 to finish top 10. He's also plus 210 to finish top 20. I am betting into the highest hold market by taking his top 20 odds, but I do think that it's still fair value there after accounting for that. And it gets me up to, you know, 33% odds of cash in that ticket, which I do think is, the way I want to play things for this week, uh, Brandon's numbers, again, do show value on him to finish top 20. So my official bet for the podcast is Sam Burns top 20 at plus 210. But what I would say is if you want to get more aggressive with Burns, it does seem like there is value elsewhere in the market too to potentially dabble in there. 48 to 1 to win, 490 top 10, plus 210 to be top 20. I think that he does have that upside based on what he has shown in some tougher field. I think he was... Pretty good in the Hero World Challenge, too, in a tougher field there. But I'll go with a plus 210 to finish top 20 for this week. And as if you uh, dabbled in any Sam Burns research yet in your uh, PGA Championship uh, search? Uh, not yet. I mean, I may look a little bit more. I think it's always interesting to find golfers that have had a couple bad weeks, even though yeah. they have a good track record over the course of the year, and also vice versa, golfers that have done really well and maybe are getting a little bit too much credit. Uh, I was actually just looking at his profile over on data golf and it looks like he's pretty strong in everywhere except for driving accuracy, mm -hmm. where he's just slightly below PGA average. But from uh, what you guys were saying on the podcast, it sounds like these have some pretty far wide fairways. So yeah, it, that shouldn't matter as much. Yeah. So it seems like someone that has a good profile for this course, uh, otherwise a very solid golfer. And, and that's what you're going to need. Yeah, Brandon sent me um, his his rundown of like each guy's top 10 odds versus what his numbers say they, they should be at. And there were only two guys who were seven to one or shorter to finish top 10 who actually showed good value. Uh, they were Sam Burns and Russell Henley. So it's a tough it's tough to bet these non outright markets because the hold is so high. But I think with Burns specifically, you can still get some value there. So Sam Burns plus 210 to finish top 20. For this week, that is all that we have here for for covering the spread for this week for the PGA Championship. I want to give one final big shout out to Andy Molitor, though. Check him out on Twitter at Andy Molitor and that or Andy MSFW, and check out his work at BetSperts, uh, the Deep Dive Podcast, and the Brown Bag Bets as well. Ed, you were talking about Seven Nuggets Saturday. Will that be out early this week for the for the golf major? Or how does it work for this week? No, we thought about doing that, but the open rate is. Uh, it's a lot less on Thursday than on Saturday. So Makes sense. decided to stick stick with Saturday. Um, we've been having a lot of interesting things. We still do usually at least an NFL one every week and then NBA um, and, and golf and other things. So, um, oh, yeah, I mean, we probably, yeah, we did some live predictions last time for live. We did some uh, kind of in, in tournament predictions with the Masters last time. So uh, might do that again. Actually, I haven't, I, yeah, it's the first time I thought about that this week because I've been thinking about <laughs> the email all week. So, um, but yeah, you can get that at thepowerrank.com. Sign up for my free email newsletter. Uh, I will be talking about PGA this week and then uh, Seven Nuggets Saturday. All righty. Uh, again, to get the emails, go to thepowerrank.com and sign up there. Check out Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. Ed mentioned our DFS podcast with myself and Brandon Gadula, who I mentioned. It's good. 
16,000 times is this podcast thing I mentioned, Brandon. Either way, uh, that is up on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed, wherever you get that, or wherever you get your podcast. Just search for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed there. Hit subscribe and also subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for this week. Good luck to you with your PGA Championship bets or anything else you're betting. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.